A while back I did a video where I asked you guys if you would be interested into delving into more information for how each class plays in Hardcore WoW. A ton of you said yes, so here we are. I've decided to start off with a class that's very close to my heart. It is the first class I ever made in WoW all those years ago, and a class that has certain reputations. Some of them good, some of them not so good. The Hunter. As per usual, I will eventually cover all classes in the game and will aim to break down their strengths and weaknesses, as well as including tips to help you on your hardcore journey, such as talents, important abilities to prioritize while leveling, weapon progression where relevant, macros, add-ons, all that kind of stuff. So let's make a start. The Hunter. Often seen as one of the most capable soloing classes in the game, with a toolkit of CC, consistent damage, and a pet to ensure that you can sit comfortably 30 yards away from danger, firing your bow. It's also often the case that people recommend Hunter as a good class for newer players in general to World of Warcraft, just because they play so smoothly and safely. Yet whilst Hunter is easy to pick up, I also believe it's the single highest skill cap class in the game, with a pet control, tons of mechanics you don't find on any other class in the game, and a habit of making the player perhaps a little too confident going into dangerous situations. There is a ton to talk about here, so let's break down the Hunter in Hardcore WoW. Coming in fresh to hardcore, it's hard to not recommend having the hunter near the top of the list, and it's the combination of having a very capable pet tank alongside a huge auto attack range that really makes the hunter a very safe class to level if you are taking things slow. But just as I mentioned, this class has a ton of unique mechanics that you need to be aware of. For example, during vanilla, ranged auto attacks have a minimum of 8 yards, and melee is 5 yards minimum, so if an enemy is standing in that 5 to 8 yard distance, away from you, you will be unable to attack them at all. This is called the dead zone, and in leveling focus content tends to be less of a problem, but there are still many mobs which can root with nets or frost novas, so try to avoid getting caught out and being unable to deal any damage. Melee and range swing timers are also separated in vanilla, meaning if you are min-maxing, you can have your pet hit one target with a second mob hitting you, and then tab between them to raptor strike or just melee when it comes off of cooldown. Much more of a speedrun type thing to do, but it is fun to pull off. And we should talk about your pet too. In Classic, it's not a mindless beast that you can just have exist next to you and forget about it. Your pet needs to be actively worked on just as much as your character does. To start off with, you don't get a pet until level 10, and those first 10 levels can actually be quite painful as you won't have access to wing clip to help kiting. You will have concussive shot, but generally don't overpull like crazy when you're going fresh out of your starter zone. Once you do hit 10 and finish your pet quest, you will not have access to some of the core abilities to maintain your pet, such as revive pet, fee pet, and beast training. You will need to venture to your near faction capital city to pick these up. And when you tame your first pet, they are not going to be very happy. And if their happiness goes low enough, they will just straight up run off. So make sure your pet doesn't die before you finish this quest, or just go get it done as a priority. You will also want to feed your pet to increase its happiness. Each pet eats different food, which you can check via the pet tab under your character. Higher tiers of food give more happiness, and you should be feeding them food which is roughly the same as their level. This directly boost the damage that they deal as well as causing your pet to gain loyalty. What's a loyalty you ask? Well it's a stat that determines how much your pet likes you and it's a stat that you want to max out on your main pet. As time passes and you gain experience your pet's loyalty level increases. It looks like a kind of bluish colour ding animation when it goes up and it caps out at level 6. This in turn will give you more training points to spend on your pet. So what are training points then? This is a number determined by your pet's level as well as loyalty. You can choose what to spend them on by opening your beast training tab in your spellbook. This will show you all your learned ranks of abilities to train your pet with. Now some of these abilities are learned directly from a pet trainer who are found next to your class trainers. These are, generally speaking, your defensive abilities such as extra armor, spell resistances, growl, and so on. Oh, by the way, you get a new rank of growl every 10th level and you should go learn it as soon as possible. It's also the only trained ability that costs zero training 
training points too. But if you want to learn new offensive moves, you have to do it through taming beasts out in the wild. Some pets when tamed will have new ranks of abilities or abilities that you haven't learned yet at all. So if I just hit level 40 and wanted to teach my pet bite to rank 6, I would have to run around the world spamming beast lore on random animals until it says one of them knows this ability. Or, you know, you can just use Petopia like a normal person and look at which beasts have it. You then have to stable your main pet, go train a beast which has your desired ability or rank, and then have them use this ability in front of you, and eventually you, as in the hunter, will learn this technique and it will appear in your beast training spellbook. You then abandon this pet that taught you the ability, or I mean, you can keep it if you want, and go get your main pet back out the stable and teach them the new rank using training points. I don't know how this makes sense, but that is the system that exists. It's not totally obvious how it works, so I thought I'd just explain that. I'll talk more about pets to use during the talents part of the video in case you wanted to hear about that. Oh, and of course, don't forget about stocking up on ammo when in town either. Your general goods vendors will have some for sale. With that out of the way, how does the hunter perform solo? Well, for me, hunter is without a doubt the single best class in the game for soloing mobs, which are higher level than you. Not even elites necessarily, just stuff that's a higher level. And it's not because of their pet, though the pet does help a lot admittedly. It's because ranged attacks are kind of busted in classic actually. For any other class in the game, orange mobs can be a challenge and red mobs are just straight up not worth the risk. For the hunter, if you have space to run, it's all fair game. This is because ranged attacks cannot be parried, dodged or blocked. They either miss or they hit. So when you're attacking something higher level, you're rolling against way fewer failure points on their defense table compared to melee classes who will have a hard time landing attacks, or spellcasters who will have most of their spells partially or entirely resist. When you add on aspect to the cheater and concussive shot to this, you become literally impossible to catch, meaning as long as you can keep hitting whatever it is and running, they will go down eventually. This can be useful for soloing elites at a lower level than normal, picking off name mobs which are way higher level than anything else in the area, or rare mobs which tend to be a lot stronger than your standard mobs too. But even if you aren't testing the limit and going for quests which other classes wouldn't be able to do, Hunter is just an absolute powerhouse of a solo class. Low downtime thanks to the bulk of your damage coming from auto shot in your pet, good consistent damage, super long attack range, aspect to the cheater from level 20, which gives you 30% bonus movement speed, up to 36% talented. This makes a huge difference in the cardio simulator that vanilla questing is, and so much more. So for the solo player that wants something pretty chill, to the speedrunner looking to min-max hunter mechanics, you really can't go wrong with this class. In a group, the hunter is near enough always a solid addition, for kind of the same reasons that they excel solo. Though in groups you may be called upon for some more utility though, such as a frost or freezing trap to control groups of enemies or using flare to check for stealth mobs ahead of you. Your pet can very much be a blessing or a curse in group content, from weird pathing leading them to pulling extra mobs, pets with dash on getting feared into different rooms, and of course the classic hunter please turn off taunt moment. Then again you have the possibility of having an off tank, pulling large groups of enemies with eyes of the beast and more. Experienced hunters compared to those newer to the class will become noticeable in groups by really taking advantage of their full toolkit instead of kind of just chilling at the back and pressing auto shot. The hunter's survivability is kind of a weird one. I don't think it's as amazing as people make it out to be, and when things go wrong, which eventually they will, you may not be well equipped to deal with it. First up though, there's the big ability I've got to mention, Fane Death. This might just be the single best defensive spell in the entire game. 30 second cooldown, instantly removes you from combat and completely drops you from the threat table. It is just overpowered in hardcore. This is the I win button of the defensive category. But there are a few things to say about it all the same. It can be resisted, specifically against higher level mobs or when you're pulling multiple mobs, this is not uncommon at all. And it really is a single point of failure. If Fane flops, you can be in big trouble. Second is you don't get Fane until level 30. That is a lot of levels and 
the early game is when a majority of players die because they don't have their class's full toolkit. You're going to be doing some of the most dangerous levels in the game without your best ability, which can be quite tough. Other things to take into account with survivability are weapon skill and defense. You need to train your active melee weapon, it's not just a stat stick. If a mob gets on you and wing clip gets parried and dodged six times in a row, you're gonna feel bad about that. Also being hunter in range, your defense skill is not very likely to be capped for your level because you need to be getting hit for it to go up. The uh, simple way I guess to think about this is if your defense skill is 15 or more levels lower than its possible cap at any given level, a mob the same level as you will be able to hit you with crushing blows which deal 150% of normal damage. As opposed to if your defense is capped for your level, a mob would have to be three levels higher than you in order to land a crushing blow. I just thought I'd mention this in case you're wondering why you're taking so much damage. When leveling a hunter on hardcore, I've even received crushing blows from mobs a lower level than me because my defense has been leveled up that little. Oh, and one more thing about survivability. Before level 40, you have to use a leather instead of mail, which of course provides way less armor. Either way, hunters are well equipped to survive tough situations, just make sure you don't rely entirely on feign death and level your melee weapon up. Next up, how fast is this class to level up on? Well, it is vanilla, so whatever you're doing it is going to be a long old grind, but the hunter is absolutely up there among some of the speediest levelers in the game. Most notably, I think this class is a fast leveler even for somebody who isn't trying super hard to min-max with pulling multiple mobs, melee weaving, or anything like that. Low downtime and aspects of the cheater from an early level are a big deal. Whilst others have to stop and drink, the hunter keeps going and going. Now I want to talk about talents and pets. Pets first. So are there any specific ones which you should be using? Honestly, I don't think it's a super big deal and the differences are minor between pets. If I had to choose, I would go for a bird. They have access to Screech, which causes minor damage to your main target and reduces the attack power of all nearby enemies, lowering their damage by a small amount. They can also get Dive, which is just your pet's version of Sprint to get them between targets faster, which I think is very useful. Saying that, not everyone's starter zone has access to getting birds early, but everyone can get a cat quite early on. Cats are good as they attack fast, can learn bite or claw as well as dash, and if you go down the route to beast mastery, ideally you do want a fast hitting pet for better uptime on the frenzy talent. Worth a mention in case anyone out there is lucky enough to see him, there is a totally unique rare spawn level 36 cat in the Badlands called Broken Tooth. This cat for some reason has one attack speed, which is the fastest in the entire game out of all pets, meaning this cat is amazing for frenzy uptime. He will be permanently camped and tamed on spawn, but if you run across him, might be worth picking up. At the end of the day, the differences are quite small, and I think the pet is up to you and what you want most. You think plane striders are cool? You go get a plane strider. You like turtles? Go tame a turtle. Now let's get on to talents. So as a quick mention, Marksman is a good tree for dealing damage. But early game, you're going to be doing too much damage and kiting mobs more so than having your pet tanking them. Also, you're going to have mana problems and a squishy pet. Survival is not half bad either, but it also runs into the squishy pet issue, whilst also having more supportive talents rather than the big gameplay enhancing ones that we want early game. So for me, this is why the hunter more or less has to go down the beast mastery tree. It's just got too many good things going for it. It beefs up your pet, aka your own personal walking tank a good amount, extra movement speed on aspects of the cheetah really adds up over time, and passive movement movement on your pet from bestial swiftness is also very useful before you get dash or dive. Heading down into the tree you can get intimidation which is a stun and a big threat modifier for your pet. This is the only way you can interrupt spell cast, so that is really good to have. 4 out of 5 on frenzy is fine, 80% chance is more than good enough with how often your pet will be critting. And then we go down to the bottom of the tree into bestial wrath. A 2 minute cooldown, 50% extra damage increase and immunity to a bunch of different effects for 18 seconds on your pet. Really good cooldown you can fire off regularly while leveling, allowing your pet to mow through multiple mobs like they are nothing. For me, this is a good standard beast mastery build. Some people go and prove revive pet instead of aspect of the hawk, but I prefer to try and not let my pet die and just deal more damage. 
up to you. At level 40, where you go next is down to preference. As a rule of thumb, marksman is for damage, the Bible is for utility. The points you'll spend in marksman are pretty meta and not really flexible. All of these are quite key in terms of saving mana and dealing extra damage. You also get aim shot too, which in classic is a big long cast, which can cause some serious damage. Watch your threat on this one. Alternatively, I think going into survival does make a lot of sense on a hardcore character. I would probably be inclined to do this myself, to be honest. It's more so about living, not just maximizing your damage. Now for this subspec, I think a lot more of it does come down to preference. I've gone full into entrapment because I like the talent. It can chain proc several times in a row, meaning sometimes mobs get stuck in a frost trap for over 10 seconds. I've gone into survivalist for more health and deterrence for another defensive cooldown. Two points in to improve feign death and one into trap mastery should dramatically reduce the chance either of these spells resist. Keep in mind though, all spells will always have a 1% chance to resist no matter how much hit you have. I spent the final two talents on sure-footed, mainly for the 2% hit. I would also consider clever traps to synergize with entrapment better. So those are your talents. Now we have abilities because you don't just go to the shop and click buy everything. Abilities are really expensive and you need to be saving for your mount. Also, some of them might not be totally worth it. I've tried to color code the hunter's ability toolkit here. Green are the ones I would prioritize whenever I have the chance to level them up. Yellow is either optional or I wouldn't level them fully because the gold cost at max rank is kind of high, such as for wing clip or distracting shot. And red are the ones which I think you could avoid spending gold on until you have the gold to spare. Also worth a mention, tranquilizing shot is from a tome in molten core, so you won't learn it when you're level 60, but you will pick it up when you have the chance to do so. The key abilities you will use more than anything else will be Hunter's Mark, Serpent Sting, and Arcane Shot. I take Track Hidden and always keep it active because it increases your stealth detection, which can help on certain quests. Reminder that all traps share a cooldown and Frost and Freezing Trap tend to be useful most of the time. Immolation Trap and Raptor Strike are both good damage dealing abilities worth leveling, they just start to get kind of expensive at high ranks and I'd have to think twice about it. Similar story with Distracting Shot, I do think it's an underrated ability. It doesn't taunt in vanilla as it does in Wrath, but it causes a large amount of threat, which sometimes can keep your pet alive as a mob tries to run to you. Either way, these are just my thoughts on what I would level. Of course, if I was grouping consistently or running as a duo or trio, I would pick up Aspect of the Pack straight away and consider Explosive Trap too, for example. So take it with a grain of salt as for what fits you and how you play the game. Now I want to talk about weapons for hunters. So despite being a physical damage dealing class and them typically valuing weapons a lot. If you're going down the beast mastery tree, it's not the biggest deal in the world to have an amazing weapon. Baseline, you only have one attack modified by your weapon speed, which is multi-shot, but you're not going to be using this a ton while leveling due to its high mana cost. On top of that, a big chunk of your damage will be coming from your pet. All the same, don't discount just straight up buying common quality bows from a vendor, as good quest rewards are quite scarce. But if you did want some quests, here they are. Keep in mind these quests can be started at an earlier level than mentioned, but very much at your own risk. At around level 14, Horde can do Centaur Bracers in the Barrens for an Orcish Battle Bow. At level 16, Alliance can do a Hunter's Boast in Eastern Loch Modan, rewarding either a bow or a gun. A while later at level 29, there are powerful upgrades for both factions behind quite tricky quests. The Alliance have Orma's Revenge in the Wetlands, which gives Raptor's End, and the final part of the Sacred Flame quest for Horde in 1000 Needles awards a good bow too. The next big upgrade has to be from Big Game Hunter around level 43 or so. This is the final part of Nessingwari's quest chain to bring in the head of King Bangalash. Very soloable as a hunter, just remember to stun him around 50% to prevent adds from spawning. At level 51 or so, so your big first endgame weapon to look out for is Verdant Keeper's Aim from Corruption of Earth and Seed. This involves defeating Princess Theradras and Maradon, so it will be challenging and is a dungeon quest, but is a weapon that will last you for a very, very long time. Also, don't forget to upgrade your quiver or ammo pouch. This both allows you to carry more ammo as well as passively increasing your ranged attack speed. At level 10, go buy a medium quiver from a vendor, and at level 30, a heavy quiver or whatever the gun variant is. Progression kind of caps out here 
if you aren't a level worker. Either way, you should definitely be doing this. Next, macros and add-ons, and I'll be keeping it specific to what I would get on Hunter. Add-on-wise for Hunter, I've always got to have a swing timer. There is a wind-up time when you go to shoot your ranged weapon. Knowing when this is for kiting or just moving in general is really useful. I would also consider some kind of threat meter, such as Details Tiny Threat or Modern Target Frame, which adds a threat number to the top of enemies' portraits. Your pet is going to be tanking most of the time. You're going to be second on threat. Having a good idea when you're going to be taking aggro is pretty useful. Not super necessary, of course, but it can be nice. Macros now, if you want any, they'll be in the description. Cast Auto Shot. So this makes it so you cannot toggle your auto shot on or off and you can spam the button. I don't know how people play Hunter without this. Wait until you see how easy it is to toggle auto shot on and off by mistake and then come and get this macro. By far the one I use the most. You can also throw a pet attack macro into your auto shot too, so your pet will always be going after your main target. I bind pet passive as well, this just calls your pet back to you. It's useful if mobs are running in fear towards other groups and you don't want your pet to chase, you change your mind on sending your pet in, you need to save your pet when it's on low health, and so on and so forth. Speaking of passive, I would generally keep your pet on passive all of the time too. Defensive is okay, but sometimes you're running away from mobs and you don't want your pet to be constantly hitting things and dragging them along with you. Also, pet aggressive is key binded by default. Unbind this. Seriously, there will be that one time when somehow, some way you turn it on, you're gonna be in a dungeon and your pet will go zooming towards three packs of elites. For me, it was under keybinds, action bar, pet button 8, and it was on the bind control 8. This is one of the few abilities in the game where if you think you need it, just click it. Cast Eagle Eye allows you to spam this ability. Without this, you can only cast it once and then it will redirect you back to the player. It's actually very useful for finding where mobs have spawned in a zone when they have multiple spawns. Have you ever wanted to find Fosrock in Arathi Highlands? Now you can do it without doing laps of the zone. Start attack and cast Raptor Strike can be useful for a simple one button melee macro. You can add in counter attack or mongoose bite too if you have them. Finally something here to feed your pet in one button, just update the macro with whatever food you use. And that is about all I have for the Hunter. Definitely a class that can be great for all players, whether you're just starting Classic Hardcore or you've been giving it a go for a while now. It's in that unique place of both being super accessible, but also having a really high skill cap to play optimally. Either way, I hope you found some of the information here useful for your Hardcore journey. And if you decide to go with a Hunter, I don't think you will regret it. Let me know your thoughts below and anything else big that you would add to what I've gone over here. Also, what class do you guys want to see next? We have every single one in the game left, the bar hunter, so just let me know. And as always, thank you all so much for watching and listening in, and I'll see you all in the next one very soon.